This is the chapter four, part two, pre-class lecture. So in the part one pre-class lecture, we talked about the carbon cycle and we talked about the different reservoirs uh, on the earth, including the atmosphere, the surface waters and oceans, the soil, fossil fuels, and also in the carbonate containing rocks where carbon exist and carbon normally exists in these different reservoirs in particular types of compounds carbon dioxide co2 being the most prominent one but also other compounds especially in the atmosphere you have carbon in the form of carbon dioxide mostly but also carbon monoxide and methane ch4 and then in carbonate containing rocks carbon is a part of the polyatomic molecule carbonate and therefore the carbonate polyatomic ion is normally paired with the metal ion and therefore you have an ionic compound in which the carbon exists and so we're going to in the part two pre-class lecture focus on why it matters where the carbon atoms end up as far as which reservoir those carbon atoms end up. Why is that important? And then we're going to also talk about greenhouse gases. And then we're going to add to our knowledge of how to draw Lewis structures that we gained in chapter three. And we're going to build on that Lewis structure knowledge to better and further understand the electron groups that surround the central atom of Lewis structures and therefore in being able to analyze the types of groups of electrons around the central atom use that knowledge to be able to to, to determine the electron geometry of a compound as well as the molecular geometry of a compound and then building further on that in conjunction with our study of greenhouse gases we'll also focus on the bonds that make up each type of molecule that we draw the Lewis structure for and analyze the bond and decide whether or not the bond is polar or nonpolar now ionic compounds have ionic bonds However, molecular or covalent compounds have covalent bonds. And so we're going to analyze molecular compounds and take a further look at their bonds, knowing that they're covalent bonds, but we need to further describe the bonds as being either polar covalent bonds or nonpolar covalent bonds. And then after analyzing the bonds that make up a particular molecule, then being able to take the nature of the bonds in consideration and then decide whether the molecule itself is overall a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule. So first let's start to look at answering the question, why does it matter where carbon atoms end up? 46% of the sun's radiation gets absorbed by the Earth. Of that 46% that's absorbed by the Earth, 37% of it is re-emitted in the form of infrared radiation, also called IR radiation. And it's the infrared radiation from the sun that is the actual heat that we feel from the sun. And so this re-emitting of the sun's radiation in the form of IR radiation results in what's known as a greenhouse effect. And this greenhouse effect keeps the Earth at a moderate temperature. And that moderate average temperature on Earth is about 15 degrees Celsius. So this greenhouse effect keeps this natural balance of heat in the Earth and keeps the Earth warm enough to sustain life on Earth as we know it. 
Without this natural balance, the Earth would be very, very cold with an average temperature of about negative 18 degrees Celsius. And so in this next figure, you see you have a picture of the sun and its radiation leaving the sun headed towards Earth. Of all the sun that's emitted, of the sun's radiation that's emitted, 46% of it is actually absorbed by the Earth. So what happens to the other 54%? Well, that other 54%, 23% of it is absorbed by the in the atmosphere. Another 25% of it gets reflected from the atmosphere. And then you have the final 6% of that 54% gets reflected from the surface of the Earth back out into the atmosphere. And so if you add up the 23, the 25, and the 6, you get 54%. That's the 54% of the sun's radiation that is not absorbed by the Earth. And here's your 40 46% that is absorbed by the Earth. So that 46% that is absorbed by the Earth, what is the faith of that 46%? Well, of the 46% that's absorbed, 37% of it is re-emitted in the form of IR radiation. And so in this picture, the blue, hour, the blue arrows represent radiation that's reflected back into the atmosphere. And then the orange-red arrows indicate radiation that is actually absorbed. So the purple arrows are reflected radiation. The red arrows represent absorbed radiation. And then of the, the uh, radiation that is absorbed in the atmosphere, about a total of 60% of it leaves the atmosphere, but the other 40% stays in the atmosphere. And so therefore, this 46%, 37% of the 46% is absorbed in the atmosphere. The other 9% is emitted from the surface as infrared radiation. And so in maintaining the Earth's energy balance, the 46% of the sun's radiation that is absorbed by the Earth's land masses and oceans, it's gonna, a portion of it goes back into space and then gets re-emitted as IR radiation. And so again, the 46%, you got 9% of it that's emitted from the surface, and then the 37% that's absorbed in the atmosphere. 
So about 80% of all the IR that's emitted by the Earth, so that 37% divided by the 46%, those percents cancel out, that gives you 80%. And so that 80% of that total 46% that's absorbed by the Earth, 37% of the 46%, is an 80% of the amount absorbed that gets emitted by Earth into the atmosphere. And this IR, when it's in the atmosphere, it gets absorbed by atmospheric gases. And so absorption of infrared radiation causes molecular vibrations in these atmospheric gases. And there are two types of molecular vibrations, bending and stretching. And so why do these vibrations happen, the bending and the stretching? Well, the bending and the stretching by atmospheric gases is due to the molecular shapes of those molecule. So the bending and stretching vibrations that happen is due to the molecular shapes of these atmospheric gases. And so there are many different gases in our atmosphere. We know that our air is composed of nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide, argon. And we also know that human activity also puts excess CO2 and water vapor into the air as a result of burning fossil fuels, which is a combustion reaction. So when we burn coal, the carbon in coal reacts with the oxygen in the air and produce CO2. And then when we burn fossil fuels, these are all, this is a combustion reaction as well. This is propane, a hydrocarbon that comes from crude oil. We produce CO2 and water. And there's our balanced combustion reaction for the burning of propane. So these are both combustion reactions. And of course, the, uh, the main side product that is important for energy purposes is you also produce produce energy in the form of heat. And so that's important for a coal burning power plant because the heat that's made from burning the coal, that heat energy is converted into electrical energy or electricity. And then of course, when we burn propane, uh, the heat, if we're using propane uh, for our gas grill, that heat is what, of course, cooks your food. But these other products of combustion reaction, the CO2 and the water vapor, these are greenhouse gases. They are greenhouse gases because they have the correct molecular shape that allows them to absorb IR radiation. And when water vapor and carbon dioxide absorb IR radiation, they undergo molecular vibrations such as bending and stretching due to the molecular shapes of carbon dioxide and water.
Now, carbon dioxide and water vapor, they have the ability to absorb IR radiation, but other gases in the atmosphere like nitrogen, N2, and oxygen, O2, these two gases do not absorb IR radiation because they don't have the shape necessary to absorb IR radiation. So vibrations, the stretching and bending that occur by greenhouse gases when they I absorb IR radiation, that is due to their molecular shape. Nitrogen and oxygen gases cannot absorb IR radiation because they don't have the correct type of shape needed in order to absorb IR radiation. So looking at these pictures here, So we said the vibrations are related to the shape of the molecule, which also influences the polarity of the molecule. So the shape and then also as a result, the polarity of the molecule. It's what gives a molecule the ability to absorb radiation and therefore to undergo these molecular vibrations of stretching and bending. And so we've got four models here of four different gas molecules. This is oxygen. And then this one is nitrogen. And so notice here we've got a double bond. And here we've got a triple bond between the two nitrogen atoms. And these are two oxygen atoms. And so these are two molecules whose molecular shape is linear. And so linear molecules They do not absorb IR. And then another fact about oxygen and nitrogen is that these are diatomic gas molecules. That means the prefix di meaning two that these molecules are made up of two of the same type of atoms. Oxygen is made up of two oxygen atoms. Nitrogen N2 is composed of two nitrogen atoms. So because the two atoms that are bonded together are the same, that means they have nonpolar bonds. connecting the atoms. And because the bonds that are connecting the atoms are nonpolar, the molecules themselves are nonpolar. And therefore, that renders oxygen and nitrogen incapable of absorbing IR radiation because they have a linear shape and because of the nature of the gases that they are diatomic, meaning that they're composed of two of the same types of atoms bonded together. That means that the bond holding those atoms together are nonpolar. And therefore, the molecules themselves are nonpolar. And that's why nitrogen and oxygen do not absorb IR, and that means that they are not greenhouse gases.
in order to be a greenhouse gas, you have to be able to absorb IR radiation. So what is the greenhouse effect? And then what gases are greenhouse gases? If nitrogen and oxygen are not greenhouse gases, then what type of gases are greenhouse gases? Well, first let's define the greenhouse effect. It is a natural process by which atmospheric gases trap IR radiation, and like we said, about 80% of what's absorbed by the Earth gets re-emitted back into the atmosphere and it gets trapped or absorbed by these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So greenhouse gases are also abbreviated GHGs, greenhouse gases. So these are gases that are capable of absorbing IR radiation. absorbing and emitting IR radiation. Due to their shape. And or polarity. So carbon dioxide, methane water vapor, those are the three more popular greenhouse gases. Some other greenhouse gases are ozone, the air pollutant N2O, which is a secondary air pollutant. Most environmental and climate scientists agree that these are one, two, three, four, five, six, that there are seven, I think six or seven, I think, yeah, I think six is the, the basic number. And then those CFCs that we talked about in chapter three that break down ozone, those are considered greenhouse gases also. And also the HFCs that were created to replace the CFCs because the HFCs don't break down ozone, but the HFCs do absorb IR radiation, so they are a greenhouse gas even though the HFCs do not break down ozone like the CFCs. So those are your seven main greenhouse gases. So there are seven of them. And you would consider the CFCs and HFCs a class of molecules because there's more than one type of CFC, more than one type of HFC, but they all are greenhouse gases.
And so we talked about the greenhouse effect being a natural process by which uh, atmospheric gases trap IR radiation. And therefore, those greenhouse gases are important for keeping the Earth's atmosphere and therefore the Earth itself warm enough to sustain life on Earth as we know it. And therefore, as long as the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stay balanced, then it's going to keep the Earth just warm enough in the warm enough range to sustain life as we know it on Earth. But what if we put excess greenhouse gases into the atmosphere more than would naturally be there if human activities weren't creating more greenhouse gases, like with these combustion reactions that we talked about? Burning coal, burning propane, burning gasoline, which contains octane and heptane, other hydrocarbon uh, compounds that come from crude oil, which is a fossil fuel. So, and then also deforestation by cutting down trees, another human activity. You're removing photosynthetic organisms, trees, from the natural carbon cycle. And if there are fewer trees to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, uh, then would be there if we weren't cutting the trees down, extra CO2 that normally would be taken out of the atmosphere by trees is staying in the atmosphere. And so putting extra CO2 up in the atmosphere via combustion reactions, burning fossil fuels, and also deforestation, cutting down trees, so having fewer trees available to remove the, uh, the CO2, the natural uh, uh, amounts of CO2 that they are supposed to remove from the air uh, by them, those trees not being present on the earth because they've been cut down, then CO2 that would have been taken out of the atmosphere naturally is staying in the atmosphere. So those two human activities, deforestation and burning of fossil fuels, is creating what we call an enhanced greenhouse effect. And that's when there are more greenhouse gases when there are more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere due to human activities. And what that is doing is trapping more heat and less of that heat is going out into outer space. So more and more of the IR is getting trapped in our atmosphere and is not being emitted back into outer space away from our atmosphere due to the enhanced greenhouse effect. And so the anthropogenic influences of our climate are basically the human activities. And as we stated, those are burning fossil fuels and deforestation. So 
So how do we recognize a greenhouse gas from a non-greenhouse gas? And that's by the shape and polarity. So like we stated, oxygen and nitrogen are not greenhouse gases because they have nonpolar bonds in their molecular structures. Because the two atoms that are being bonded together are the same type of atom. So there's no difference in the polarity of the atoms. And so therefore the bonds are nonpolar. Greenhouse gases like methane Methane is CH4. We've got the Lewis structures drawn showing the connectivity. And then this is a three dimensional model of the Lewis structure showing its shape. And because the carbons and hydrogens bonded together have different electronegativities, these, these CH bonds, these are polar bonds. So these four single CH bonds. So all these are single bonds. And they are polar bonds. And so in our Lewis Structure Lab, we touched on the VSEPR theory, the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And so what this theory assumes is that the most stable molecular shape of a molecule is the one that has the electron pairs that are connected to the central atom as far away from one another as possible. So those four electron pairs in methane that are connected to the central carbon atom, they are as far away from each other as possible by forming a tetrahedral shaped molecule with bond angles of 109.5. So this is tetrahedral. electron geometry, which we call EG. And it also has a tetrahedral molecular geometry, which we'll abbreviate MG. And so analyzing the carbon, central carbon atom of methane, So in analyzing the central carbon atom of methane, there are four bonding electron groups. These four single bonds are all bonding electron groups. Each single bond represents two electrons. So they this central carbon atom has four bonding electron groups around it. 
and there are zero lone pairs of electrons on that central carbon atom, so there are zero non-bonding electron groups. So whenever there are zero non-bonding electron groups, the electron geometry and the molecular geometry will be the same. And in this case, tetrahedral. In order for the molecular geometry to be different from the electron geometry, In order for the Mg to be different from the Eg, the central atom in a molecule must have non-bonding electron pairs on it that are known as lone pairs of electrons. So the lone pair of electrons is going to occupy a greater space than a bonding electron pair, and therefore it's going to move the bonding electron pairs around the central atom as far away from the lone pair of electrons as possible. So for methane NH3, this eight valence electrons, two, four, six, and then the lone pair of electrons make eight. Ammonia has three bonding groups of electrons. and it has one non-bonding electron group. So therefore, the molecular geometry of ammonia will not be the same as its electron geometry. And so the electron geometry is based on the total number of electron groups, period. And so for ammonia, the EG, is tetrahedral because there are a total of four groups. Four total electron groups. Three of them are bonding. One of them is non-bonding. But because one of those four electron groups are non-bonding, the molecular geometry is trigonal pyramid. And this is for methane NH3. Now when looking at water, another greenhouse gas, H2O, water, also with eight valence electrons, two, four, six, and eight. Water has two bonding electron groups, two non-bonding electron groups, And then, of course, four total electron groups. So again, we've got a molecule with four total electron groups. So its electron geometry is tetrahedral. And its molecular geometry, due to the two non-bonding electron groups, is bent. And notice the difference in the bond angles between methane, NH3, and water. Methane with four bonding groups around the central atom and zero non-bonding groups has the largest bond angle of the three, 109.5. Ammonia having one non-bonding electron group and three bonding groups has a smaller bond angle because those bonding groups are pushed down away from the lone pairs as far as possible, 
giving them a smaller than 109.5 degree bond angle which of, of about 107 degrees. And then with water having two non-bonding groups and two bonding groups, those bonding groups are pushed even further away from the non-bonding groups, giving water an even smaller bond angle of 104.5 degrees. Now taking a look at the most consequential greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, Carbon dioxide, CO2, has 16 valence electrons, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16. And so the carbon, central carbon atom, of the CO2 it has two bonding groups of electrons and zero none bonding And so anytime again that there are no non-bonding electron groups, the EG and the MG are the same. Linear with the 180 degree bond angle for that molecule. And so analyzing the linear geometry of CO2 versus the bent geometry of water, both water and CO2 have three atoms. But the difference is water has at least one lone pair of electrons on the central atom, whereas the carbon in CO2 does not. And that's what gives water the bent geometry. And this bent geometry minimizes the repulsions between the lone pair of electrons and the, uh, and the bonding electrons. And therefore that bent shape is going to therefore influence the physical and chemical properties of the molecule. So in comparing CO2 versus ozone versus water, looking at the difference in the bond angles, as well as the molecular shape, for ozone, you've got two bonding and one non-bonding electron group. And so therefore, ozone has a trigonal planar electron geometry having three total groups. but its Mg is bent. Water has a tetrahedral electron geometry and its molecular geometry, however, is bent. So therefore, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, just like ozone and water are greenhouse gases, but the type of vibrations that CO2 will experience are going to be different from the type and number of vibrations that ozone and water experience when they absorb IR. So all three of these are greenhouse gases.
but CO2 has a linear molecular geometry. Ozone and water's molecular geometries are bent. And therefore, that's going to influence the type of vibrations and the number of vibrations that CO2 experiences versus ozone and water. And so with this little table here, comparing the number of bonded atoms to the central atom versus the number of non-bonded atoms. And therefore, the molecular geometry, which we call shape, And noticing that the bent geometry with the two num bonding and the two bonding, giving you electron ge geometry of tetrahedral. Ammonia also has an electron geometry of tetrahedral, just like methane, four total groups. If we put that column in, this would be two, this would be four, this would be three, and these would also be four. So taking a look at some questions, name three greenhouse gases. We can name any three that we like. So CO2 is the more popular one. Then others are like methane and water. And then there are others like N2O, CFCs, HFCs, so on and so forth. And so the next question, we've got five different molecules and we need to determine their molecular geometry or their shape. And so the first thing you do is you draw the Lewis structure. And then after you draw the Lewis structure, you analyze the central atom. So we put in our 16 valence electrons. So let's count to see if I have 16. Do I have less than 16? Do I have more than 16? So we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. I've made every atom happy. There are eight electrons around each atom, but the bad part is I put in 20 and I only need 16. So whenever you put in too many, you take away two of the lone pairs, one, from around, one pair from around the central atom and another pair from around an atom bonded to the central atom. And then you replace the electrons you remove by adding another single bond between the central atom and that other atom, making a double bond. Now let's do a count. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. I still have too many. So I'm going to remove a lone pair from the central atom and another lone pair from one of the outside atoms and then replace those that I took away with another single bond between the two, now giving me a triple bond. And now I have my 16 valence electrons and all three atoms are happy because all three atoms have eight electrons around them. Now that I've got my Lewis structure drawn, I analyze my central nitrogen atom. The number of bonding groups.
is two. The number of non-bonding. I've got a single bond and I've got a triple bond. Each one of those is one group. Number of non-bonding groups on the central atom is zero. So therefore, my molecular geometry, two bonding groups, zero non-bonding groups, my molecular geometry is linear. Taking a look at CCL3F, Freon 11, I think that is. It has a total of 32 valence electrons. And so I draw my Lewis structure first. So there's my Lewis structure. I've got a central carbon atom. Number of bonding groups is four. Number of non-bonding groups is zero. So my electron geometry and my, molecular ge and my molecular geometry are the same, and that's tetrahedral. Next, we have SO2. Put in my 16 valence electrons. All my atoms are happy. They all have eight electrons around them. And I've put in two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. I've put in too many. I've put in 20, but I only need 18. So I'm going to take these two away. And take these two away and replace them with another single bond between the sulfur and the oxygen giving me a double bond. So now I've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18. Now I've got my Lewis structure drawn correctly. All atoms are happy. They have eight electrons around them. So now I analyze my central sulfur atom. I've got one single bond and one double bond. So that's two bonding groups. And I've got one lone pair of electrons on that central sulfur atom. So the number of non-bonding groups is one. And so if we want to add to this table, if we've got three total groups, two bonding and one non-bonding, that molecular geometry is going to be bent. Next, we have SO3. So we need to put in 24 valence electrons and we've put in two, four, six, 
8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, and 26. So we've put in too many. So we'll take away a long pair from the central sulfur and take away a long pair from one of the outside oxygens. And then we'll replace those pairs that we took away with another single bond between those two atoms, making a, a double bond between the central sulfur and the peripheral oxygen atom. So now we analyze the central sulfur atom. Number of bonding groups. We got one, two single bonds and one double bond. So one double bond, two single bond, giving us a total of three bonding groups. The number of non-bonding groups on the central sulfur atom is zero. So three bonding and zero non-bonding. That molecular geometry is going to be the same as the electron geometry, which is trigonal planar. And then finally, we've got H2S. It's just like H2O, oxygen and sulfur are both in group six, so they should have the same geometry. Same number of valence electrons, eight. Two, four, six, eight. So the central sulfur atom has two bonding groups. It's got one, two single bonds. And it's got two lone pairs of electrons, so two non-bonding groups. So that gives us a bent molecular geometry. So just like water. And that brings us to the end of part two of our chapter four pre-class lecture.